On this episode of Delivering Marketing Joy, I talk with Jeremy Lott from Sanmar, and he talks about why to do good in business. Well, hey there, and welcome to another edition of Delivering Marketing Joy. I am your host, Kirby Hossman, and joining me today is a man I really appreciate uh, him taking the time today. He's a, a big wig in our industry. He's the president of Sanmar, Jeremy Lott. Jeremy, thank you so much for taking the time. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. You bet. You bet. So I want to jump right in. Um, Sanmar is a huge company in our industry that manages a, a large number of brands and a huge number of SKUs or products. How do you decide? Like that's, that's something I always wonder is how do you decide what products you want to add to the collection and then what products you're going to move on from? How do you make those decisions? Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through our process. Although I'll, I'll back up a little bit and say, you know, for us, when we think about Sanmar, we never think of ourselves as a huge company. We think of ourselves as a, uh, a family business that's, totally. that's managed in kind of a really entrepreneurial way. I mean, uh, growing up, it was, it, was a, it was a really small business. And, and, I, and I recognize, you know, we've gotten bigger over the years, but I think we still think of ourselves as kind of a small, uh, scrappy, entrepreneurial company in a lot of ways. But, like uh, but, we, but we carry, you know, I don't know, about 85,000 SKUs today. And, and so deciding what products make uh, make it into our catalog and how we move is a complicated process. We have uh, uh, merchandising and design teams whose job it is to really uh, they, they they shop internationally. They subscribe to ten trend reports. We have a trend editor whose job is to really take like very far out uh, macro trends affecting kind of the world and then helping us understand what that means kind of for apparel. And then they start building uh, products to meet kind of these trends. We don't try to have products that are think of a super trendy if we think it's going to be cool this summer but by fall no one's going to want it uh that doesn't really work for us if we bring something in we're going to carry it for at least three years so we know we want things that are current and modern but that have some life to them um so then our product team start building those products and i get involved at two stages the first is called design review where they pitch concepts they might have a uh they have fabric they might have uh, drawings they may have a retail inspiration sample and, and it's kind of a yay or nay, I think this is a good concept, let's keep moving on it, mm. or no, this isn't really where we want to go. Um, if, if it's a yay, then goes, and that, that product actually gets developed. They start working with factories and fabric mills. Um, our production planning team starts to put real data to how much they think it's going to sell, what the price points are going to be. Uh, and then we get to something called final adopt. And at final adopt, um, they're presenting products and about, 50% of the products get presented actually get approved to go in the line. And it's a really hard process because merchants have spent um, uh, 18 months and or a year at least and, and a lot of effort developing. And, and for me, it's kind of like telling them, you know, I don't think their kids are cute, you know. <laughs> uh, and yep. I'm like, it's a little bit of a hard process, but, but we have to cut. And so that gets to the products that actually kind of then make it into the line. Um, Every year we also discontinue products, and that's a lot easier, frankly, of a process because it's not—it's our customers telling us what they don't want to buy anymore, mm -hmm. and it's more than us. So, um, really, we look at—we look at sales, uh, we look at where product, how much inventory we have, how it's downturning, um, where we think we're going to be. Can we continue to inventory and support it in a way given its current sales level? Uh, and so, it actually. Uh, it becomes pretty clear. Yep, these are the products that we have to discontinue. There's always somebody who loved that shirt and still has an Instagram, but we really, um, by the time it gets out of our catalog, it, it, the, the sales are at the point where it just didn't make sense to carry it anymore. That's interesting. It sounds like like the the getting rid of it's more of um, more of a math decision, whereas the um, other side bringing it in is more of an art <laughs> decision almost. Right? Like that's that's super interesting. Absolutely, and and as we look at new products, we're applying. I mean, we haven't we at Final Dog. There's a number sitting next to every product. How many do we think we can sell in year one? How many think we can sell in year three? Um, but it's a guess, and it's a guess based on you know we're selling. This is a 9.99 polo shirt. What else do we have in the category? How is it going to affect other product sales? Mm -hmm. So there's there is a uh, there's science to it, but it's very much art and science, and it's yeah. really trying to understand both the trends and then. We're really guessing because we haven't sold any of these yet, but it's an educated guess. Yeah. Um, 
uh, much more so than the math really drives the, the piece on, on, on discontinued products. Well, that's great. That's great. Now, you and I talked uh, on a phone call not too terribly long ago, and I was telling you how I admire Sanmar for working to do good. Can you talk a little bit about why you have, maybe about that mission and why you have it? Yeah. So I always think, like, my dad started the company in 1971, and there was, uh, he, he really started this because it was, um, he had gotten, uh, like, there was an ethical piece of, like, the, the very beginning, or values piece, maybe is the right word, at the very beginning. He had bought 1,200 t-shirts from the largest supplier in America at the time. The, the shirts came in, they were the wrong shirt, not what he'd ordered. Mm. The supplier told him, um, you're a CRE customer, you have your shirts, I have your money, the deal is done, and then hung up on him. Oh. And my mom really said to him at the time, if they're the biggest, why don't you go compete with him? And so he had this mantra at the very beginning that was kind of tell the truth and be nice. That was his mantra for how he wanted to build a business. Love it. So those values were built in, I think, day one. I think a couple of things, though, uh, changed the way I looked at the world. And, and maybe the biggest was in 2012 when there was a large factory that collapsed in Bangladesh and uh, over a thousand people died. And there was a little bit of a soul searching moment for me saying, hey, are we in apparel production um, part of a problem in the world? Are we, um, you know, creating, you know, child labor, forced labor, you know, paying people fairly, are we doing all these terrible things and now are we actually putting people in dangerous working conditions, mm -hmm. people are dying making these shirts. Um, and I thought about it uh, because that was, the, that was the narrative if you watch the news. Yeah. Um, I said for the last 15 years I had spent a lot of time traveling the world in factories and I said that was real, the factory collapse was real, but there's a lot of really good factories and there were great partners who were doing good things in the community. And I really thought to myself, if we could take the um, our buying power and our influence with factories to do good things, we could have a really, pretty significant influence. Mm -hmm. Today, we think there's somewhere about 130 to 140 thousand people globally who sold so for Sanmar. That's a wow. pretty big amount of people that we could impact. And so we started really thinking well, how we could do that. And so we started talking to our factory partners, and we said, well, what are you guys doing? Um, in your community, what are you doing for healthcare? What are you doing for education? What are you doing beyond just you know paying people a fair wage and being compliant? And some of them started to say, well, we're actually doing these really innovative things. We thought, well, that was really interesting. And then we went to the guy across the street and we said, you know, this factory over here is doing these really innovative things. What are you guys doing? And the answer was, well, we're not doing any of that. We're saying, hmm, well, you know, part of our purchasing decision is going to be what are you doing to influence, to impact. You know your community, so maybe you should think about some things that the guy across the street is doing, and that was really impactful. We started to see um, more and more of our factories kind of engage in our partners. So for us, a big piece of our um, production decision is what's the impact that um, our partner is making kind of in their community. How are they investing to do it? Um, and we think that we can not just influence those people, but the, the communities and the, the countries kind of beyond that. And it's become a really rallying cry for everyone at Sandmark here is how do we um, take this product that we sell, this basic polo shirt, and how do we make it more than that? How do we actually kind of really create a difference um, in the world with it? And we've been, uh, it's been a really important part of our mission. Man, I love it. I, I think it's, it's really interesting. And I think more and more businesses can have that kind of impact if they just start asking those questions. So I, I appreciate your leadership on that. I, and, and I'm fascinated by leadership. So, and how, to, how I can grow as a leader. Um, so as a leader of a, an organization, I know you still think that of yourselves as small, but fairly large organization. What tips do you have for me or anyone listening on getting better as a leader? Yeah. You know, I, um, I grew up um, in the, in the leadership school of Marty Lott. So my dad was my mentor, you know, is, and, and so, uh, you know, I've learned a lot of lessons in you know, over time. I think there's two though, that for me stand out. Um, you know, I, I, hard work is maybe the first one. I think that just our family, um, that was always an expectation that there wasn't a substitute for kind of showing up and working hard and, and, and setting that example. People ask me the best advice your dad ever gave you, and I tell him, I was work harder. You know, <laughs> but I, I think sometimes um, hard work is just undervalued, and so and so we work really hard. I, and I think that sets a tone 
in the organization. I, I, I think the only other piece is, is humility and to be really humble. I, we're, um, we're not the smartest people in the world, but we listen uh, well, and I think we pride ourselves on that. We listen to our customers, we listen to our employees, um, we try to take those ideas and act on them. And so I think somebody who comes into any organization, any leader who thinks, I know it all, um, follow me because I'm the smartest guy in the room, uh, but that rarely works. I think the person who comes in and, and asks more questions than talks, listens more than they talk, and, and is thoughtful is the type of leader that I try to be. Um, and, and for us, it's been the most successful. And, and really, I've, I learned that from my dad. And, and you know, for us, it's worked really well over a long period of time. Man, that's great. That is great advice. Jeremy, I, you, you killed it. You got, uh, you got through my three questions. I yeah. give everybody a chance to ask me one question. Do you have one for me? Yeah, you know, I, um, I, I do. I've, I've been thinking a lot about this idea of, um, uh, you know, a lot of people will say it's not, it's not, it's not personal. It's just business. Mm. And and for me, I struggle sometimes with that. Yeah. I was wondering in your business, in your experience, um, how you think about that. Is it is it personal, or do you separate the two and say it's it's really it's just business for you? I 100% believe it's personal. Um, because the reality of it is I think people still buy from people and brands they like, know, and trust. And I'll be honest with you, like when we're making purchasing decisions, the relationship I have with my supplier rep, my salesperson, my or the internal team, one, it 100% plays a role in my purchasing decisions. Um, one of my good friends in the industry is Dana Zezo. And when Dana hopped or left from one supplier and went to the other, our business followed it because it was Dana and he was my friend. Now, the one thing that I would say that the caveat to that is, look, it's gotta be somewhat comparable, right? Where, where you say it's just business. Well, if one person's selling something for $5 and one's selling it for 10 and they're the same, well, then, then I think for me, where it becomes personal is to go to the person I have the relationship with and go, man, if you can get it close, we still want to go with you. So to me, it is, it's doing business is a very personal thing and I want it to be, if that yeah. makes sense. And so it, it, where the, it's not uh, personal, it's business. It's like I say, it's gotta be comparable in the numbers, but once it's that, then it has to do everything with relationship from my perspective. Well, I, 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 I... It's great to hear. That's how I feel too, and I, I, I think our industry is built on yes. those relationships, and I hope that continues for a long time. So cool. Thank you so much, Jeremy. I really appreciate your taking the time. I know you're a busy guy, and uh, we'll have to do it again sometime. Okay. My pleasure. Absolutely. Cool. Well, that's going to wrap up this edition of Delivering Marketing Joy. We'll see you next time. What's up?